Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. I hope that you are having a great day today. Amen. We are in Acts chapter 21 today. Of course, yesterday we read Acts chapter 20, and we see there the beginning of the transition that Paul was now undergoing from his third missionary journey on his way to Jerusalem, uh, where he would have some very difficult times ahead. Uh, so in our verse for today, our chapter for today, we are going to look at a couple of, um, uh, just some of the things that we see there. I'm going to just um, bring up my screen and show you the verses, and uh, we will just uh, walk through them uh, together. Let's go. All right, here we are. So. In verse number one, uh, you'll see it appearing on your screen in a moment. Uh, we are coming, here we go. Verse, verse number one and two. When we had parted from them and had set sail, we ran a straight course to cause and the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patara. And having found a ship, cross over Phoenicia, we went aboard and we set sail. So Paul is now journeying, he's on his way to Jerusalem, uh, but he's going to make a couple of stops along the way. And uh, we probably just briefly gloss over them. So in verse three, you see him here. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria, landed at Tyre, and there the ship was to unload its cargo. And then after looking up disciples while they were there, Let's look at this. We stayed there seven days. So there's a process of unloading cargo and loading um, new cargo. Of course, he's on his ship. Um, but look at what happened here in verse four. So the Lord is beginning now to use others to speak to Paul as to what some of what he was going to face. Now let's look at this. And they kept telling Paul through the spirit, not to set foot in Jerusalem. So he connected with some of the disciples there and uh, they had an insight. God gave them revelation. They had a word. And um, what were they saying to Paul? Don't set foot into Jerusalem. Obviously the Lord uh, gave them insight as to some of what Paul was going to face there. Uh, challenges that he was going to face, uh, the persecutions that he was going to face. And they interpret that to say, don't go. You know, I said this yesterday, I'll say it again today, that the safest place to be is in the will of God. Safest place for the believer to be is in the will of God. Now, the will of God does not suggest that we are not going to face persecutions. Amen. Stephen was in the will of God. What happened to him? James was in the will of God. What happened to him? So the will of God is the safest place for the believer, but it doesn't suggest that we are not going to have persecutions. It does not suggest we're not going to have hard times, but the safest place to be is in the will of God. So they sought to convince him not to go to Jerusalem. In verse 5 and 6, when our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey. Uh, they spent some time praying together. They went on the ship, uh, those who are accompanying Paul. And then the other brethren, of course, they went back home. Then they continued the journey. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemy's. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. So he stopped a little bit at Tyre. They had a day um, and they sought to just connect again with the brethren to encourage and, and to connect as believers often uh, would do. Of course, Paul would have spent that little time just to again pour in uh, to these brothers and sisters to stand their ground, to stand for God, uh, to let God be true in their lives and in so doing allow every other to be a liar. So they continued their journey. Um, 
we see in verse eight, on the next day, we left and came to Caesarea and enter in the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. Of course, one of the seven is in reference to um, who we affectionately call uh, deacons earlier when there was this conflict uh, in the book of Acts and they had they chose seven men filled with the Holy Ghost and wisdom. So here we see Philip, the evangelist, and he has seven daughters, we are told. Now, let's look at what and that the, the same man had four daughters, I beg your pardon, who were virgins, which did prophesy. In verse 10 and verse 11, let's look at that. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Specific, clear, direct word. This is what is going to happen to Paul. He was going to be bound in Jerusalem and he was going to be handed into the hands of Gentiles. Prophetic word. Can you imagine that? How would Paul respond to that? Better yet, how would the others, the other disciples respond to that? Look, look at verse 12. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. It was a heavily charged emotional atmosphere, no doubt. And in as much as Paul would have been touched by just the expression of love and sympathies, quote unquote, he was really focused on the mission. This is what he says here in the latter part of verse 13. And this is now in regards to the, the prophetic word that Agabus spoke and the response of his brothers and sisters in the Lord. He said, for, um, for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord, Jesus. He said, I'm ready. Whatever it is, I am in the will of God. And I'm going to do what God wants me to do. They sought to change his mind, but he was set. Look at verse 14. And since he would not be persuaded, because they tried, we just fell silent, remarking the will of the Lord be done. Paul was focused on what he was about. And while he had to deal with the emotions of the others, and as a human being, his own emotions too, but he was fixed. I am going to do what God wants me to do. You know, brethren, that's something for us to ponder. It's going to be hard sometimes. Eh? It has been hard sometimes. But the man of God, the woman of God, child of God, must be prepared to do what God wants, even if it is uncomfortable, even if it is something that one would prefer not to do. The will of God must take precedence, preeminence in our lives. You remember Jesus in the garden. If it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. And I believe that's a prayer that we all will pray many times throughout the course of our lives. When we get a glimpse of what God is doing and the price that we are going to have to pay, may we in those moments say, nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. For Paul, there was no bargaining that needed to be done. He was settled. This was the will of God for his life. And he was going to do what God wanted him to do. As he said in the verse before, even if I have to die, I am prepared to die for the name of the Lord. So he was set. He was, his mind was made up. So they continued their journey toward Jerusalem. And eventually, verse 17, we see them arriving in Jerusalem and they were gladly and warmly received 
by the brethren. Following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders that were present. And after he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. You know, Paul would not have had this kind of connection with James and the other leaders of the church in Jerusalem for years. And so he's recounting, can you imagine one by one and think about just the, the, the emotions that would have been attached to these series of events, these series of victories and challenges that he would have gone through. If you look on this, arguably this would have been the last time Paul had a conference, a connection uh, with the brethren, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. This was when he went up, you remember, when there was some question about circumcision and they had this Jerusalem council, he made his case and the instruction that was given uh, by James was that, listen, these Gentiles, we are not going to demand of them to observe circumcision and these laws of Moses. And of course, talked about fornication, um, talk about eating meat with blood and so forth. They were warned not to participate in those, but the laws and customs of the Jewish nation, it was not required, it was not necessary for salvation. And that was communicated, you remember, to Paul. He went back to the brethren there in Asia. He shared this with them. And also the two of the beloved disciples went down with him to validate his ministry and to validate the message that he had been preaching. So it was from Jerusalem council that he traveled and he had his imprisonment. You remember that great speech there in Athens. They had set the conflict at Corinth and just the numerous travels that he would have had. And he went full circle really, because here he is now again in Jerusalem, the verse we just read, now giving an account, a report of what would have transpired over the course of those years. Look at this. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, so they were excited, the apostles and the brethren, the leaders and the saints who were there, they were excited about what God was doing and they glorified God. And they said to him, you see brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. Look at this now. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses's, Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. So there was some propaganda being spread. Mischief was at work. The enemy was at work. And what were these brethren told? That a part of Paul's presentation, his message, was that the Jews who lived in Asia, they should not observe the laws of Moses, whether it was circumcision of their children, and other customs. So this was what he was accused of. They said, this is what you are doing. This is what we heard. Of course, that would have been problematic in that particular space because of course in Jerusalem, it was predominantly Jews who became Christians, who became believers, but they still maintained their identity, many of them as it relates to for example, circumcision and some of the customs, the teachings of Moses. Let's look at it a little bit more. The elders of Jerusalem were happy with what God was doing among the Gentiles. Yet in Jerusalem, the Christian community was almost entirely from a Jewish background. And these Christians still valued many of the Jewish laws and customs. The Christian community of Jerusalem heard false rumors about Paul they heard that he had become anti-Jewish and had told Jewish Christians that it was wrong for them 
to continue observing Jewish laws and customs. Of course, that was fabricated. That was not true. Paul at no time preached to the Jews that they should forsake the, the laws, circumcisions, and so forth of Moses. If you remember, predominantly his ministry was to the Gentiles. Well, let's talk on it a little more. Paul didn't have a problem with Jewish Christians who wanted to continue to observe old customs and laws. It seemed that he himself saw sometimes, such as when he took and fulfilled the vow of consecration. And we read that earlier uh, when we did chapter 18. Paul seemed fine with this, as long as they didn't think it made them more right before God. So Paul didn't have a problem with them observing and doing circumcision and so forth. He wanted them to be certain, though, that this would not make them righteous, that the observation of these ceremonial laws or, and so forth weren't able to save them. Salvation came through Jesus Christ alone. Let's, let's look at the verses a little more. What then is it to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. So the disciples there in Jerusalem saying, listen, it's just a matter of time when the entire city will know that you are here. They have heard this, that this is what you were doing. We now need to find a way to calm them, to cause them to be settled, to, call, to reassure them that this is not the case. So they shared this with him. Therefore, do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourselves along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and all will know that there is nothing to do, nothing to the things which they would have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. So there were some men who were observing and it may have been the Nazarite vow. And he said, okay, go through the process of what they as Jews considered purification, be a part of it, go to the temple, and offer the required offerings so that those who are there will observe that you are not teaching anti-Judaism or anti-Jewish customs, anti-Jewish principles, you are not. So that should cause them to be settled. Uh, let's see if this will work because, you know, in Romans chapter 14, four and six, um, one of the things that we observe, and I think this was very important that we also consider, uh, if you look at verse four, who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be old enough, for God is able to make him stand. Look at what Paul says. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. And the point I wanted to make with this particular verse is this, that Paul was not anti-Judaism. He was not anti these customs and these cultures that, that they had they, they had existing. Because if you look at this particular verse, he's saying if a man choose to choose a particular day to honor God, that's okay. And if a man chooses not to observe the day, that's okay too. Why is he saying this? Because a man is not justified by the day. A man is not justified by observing a particular feast day. Justification is through Jesus Christ. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ. And so he spoke to that when he addressed um, the brethren in Rome. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, and then here you find the elders again reiterating, now listen to the Gentiles who believe, these are the restrictions we placed on them. They should not eat meat, that is sacrificed to idols. They should not be 
participating with, you know, eating of, drinking of blood, and they should, of course, abstain from fornication. So again, this goes back to uh, the book of Acts chapter 15 at that council. And so the leaders, really, they are reiterating that this was what was established. Now, Paul went ahead and uh, he did what was suggested. Of course, he did this not because he thought that it justified him. It made him clean. Because if you remember in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, it's right there on your screen. Uh, you can read it. Um, he talked about he becoming all things to all men. And he said, listen, I'm free. But I become all things to all men for one purpose. The 23rd verse says, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. So Paul is saying, I'm doing these things, but I'm doing it for the purpose of the kingdom. He knew and he thought that the observation of these laws and so forth didn't justify anybody, but we are justified by grace, God's grace. But he said there were things that he did. He became all things to all men, so that by all means, he would save some. That's verse 22. And you know, brethren, um, you know, one of the things, as I read this and I thought about this, um, one of the things that came to mind, you know, all of us have our little idiosyncrasies, there are little dislikes, you know, the things that cause our blood to boil and we sometimes get righteously indignant. Um, we all have those, right? And many of these stem from the culture, our culture, the culture in which we grew, uh, we got saved. And so we have some little things that it is not necessarily scriptural, it's cultural. One of the things that we have to be so clear on is what are the teachings of scripture and what are cultural. And Scripture always take precedence. Scripture can never be wrong. Culture can be wrong, but scripture can't be wrong. And so you and I have to look at it so carefully that we don't disqualify anybody because of culture. Now, there is a mature way to assess this. I have, and Paul talked about this when he talked about meat, eating meat. You and I have received liberty. The Christian, we have liberty. But we must not use our liberty to injure others. We must not use our liberty to cause our brothers and sisters for who Christ died to lose their way. We ought not to use it and become a stumbling block to our brother and our sister. So I have liberty in many matters, knowing that, and Paul, the, the classic case with Paul was the whole matter of eating meat and so forth, offered to idols. Paul knows that there's one God and he made that very good point. But he said, though I have the liberty, I am not going to exercise that liberty if it is going to cause my brother to suffer, to lose his salvation. If I am going to become a stumbling block to my brother, then I'm not going to part, I'm not going to exercise my liberty in eating this meat. And so I, I think a lot of the things can be clarified and uh, we can avoid some of the controversies if we value the next person, esteem the other above ourselves, as the scripture says. So I must not use my Christian liberty to cause you to lose your salvation. Perhaps I might be mature in a particular area. Somebody's a new convert and so they are struggling. And if they see me do this, this it may cause them to lose their way. And so I cannot exercise liberty there to say, oh, I have Christian liberty, I can do this. No, I must always consider my brother and my sister. I must not. So let me reiterate the point. 
I must be very careful as a mature saint that I don't judge and condemn somebody because of culture. Doctrine is clear. Standards of holiness is fundamental doctrine too. But culture, if we are not careful, we can allow culture to supersede scripture. And that's never right. That's anti-God. That's not apostolic. So let me make this final point and we move on. I have a responsibility to determine what is cultural, what is scriptural, and give precedence every time to the scriptures. There are aspects of culture that is important that we uphold. As long as these cultures are not anti-God because there are some cultural practices that are beneficial for us as God's people in serving him where we are. And that must never be mistaken that, and that can never be overstated too. There are some cultural practices that is important for us as Christians in the space that we operate. But we must remember that scripture takes precedence every single time. And so Paul was reminded, not that he needed the reminder that this was what was given to the Gentiles for them to observe, not for them to be forced to observe Jewish teachings, Jewish traditions, circumcisions, and so forth. That was never for them. And as, as leaders, you know, we have to be very careful of uh, what we demand of people, especially if it is our own ideas, our own views, views that might be shaped by our culture, but not be culturally relevant. We have to be able to decipher both because cultures will change. And so there are some things that can change. Fundamental doctrine never change. Standards of holiness, right living, Christian living, they cannot change regardless of which culture we go. We must present our bodies as living sacrifices. So Paul did what was suggested to him. He went into the temple and when he got into the temple, um, there was an uproar. After a while, they identified him and uh, they saw him and they, you know, they began to make some accusations against him saying in verse, uh, verse 27, um, let's look at verse 28, men of Israel, come to our aid. King James says, help. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. See ex the, the, the exaggeration. So even if they heard something, and these of course were Jews who came down from Asia. And so there is this over-exaggeration. Even if they heard a little something, they are owning it, presenting it as fact, but they're also saying that he, he has done this everywhere. He has turned every man against the laws of Moses. And there was a unanimity among the believers, um, the worshipers rather in the temple, because what they did, they ran out and they dragged him out of the temple and they were about to kill him. In verse 31, they were seeking to kill him. A report came to the command of the Roman cohort that Jerusalem was in confusion. Thank God. And again, of course, God was always in control because he's always in control every time he is. So the commander gathered soldiers, rushed to the temple and stopped them from beating Paul. And after this, they saw to, well, first of all, they thought that he must be some criminal because the rage that he saw, he thought that this man must be evil. And so he ordered him to be born with two chains. And when he bound him, he started to ask, what is it that he had done? And there was a confusion among the crowd because nobody could truly say what he did. They were angry at him 
but they really couldn't say it. There was no, no unity among the gathering as it relates to what is crime or is the accusation is against him. So this is what he faced, got some good hits, but he kept on going. And as brothers and sisters, there are gonna be times when we will get some, but we have to get up and keep fighting the battle for the Lord. Look at what Paul did here in verse 35. When he got to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people kept following them, shouting away with him, even while the soldiers had laid hold on Paul, taking him away, the crowd, they were coming, they still wanted to kill him. So look at the last two verses here. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness, assassins out into the wilderness. So you see what is happening here too. Um, the leaders, the commander is thinking that he was some evil man and perhaps that's the reason why he had him bound in two chains. So he had a view of Paul even before he knew who he was. And that will happen. People will have a view of us uh, before they know exactly who we are. And I believe all of us can testify to that. We all had views of people before we really knew them. And when we spend some time with them, we realize, oh, this is nothing like what I heard. Some of them, we even became friends with them, very good friends. And so we have to try everything, prove all things the scripture tells us. So let's, let, let's just close out. But Paul said, I'm a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. And I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. And he is not about to give a very powerful speech. And he was going to give this speech in the Hebrew dialect. Of course, he was in Jerusalem. He's going to speak in the language that they all could understand what he was saying. And this um, testimony, powerful sermon in Acts uh, 22, um, will, will, is gonna rob them, but he's going to recount just what happened to him. Because you see, brethren, nobody can take away your testimony. You know exactly what God has done for you. And it doesn't matter what people say or do, nobody will ever be able to erase your testimony. And it is your testimony that's going to serve as the motivation to keep on going, to keep on believing, to keep on serving, even when people don't understand it, even when it becomes difficult. It is your testimony that we're gonna use. We read in Revelation that the, the group overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And so brethren, let's keep pondering the word of the Lord. Uh, let's apply God's truth to our lives and let's stand for God regardless. And when a prophetic word comes, it doesn't mean that God wants you to escape. It might just be that God wants you to know that he knows. He's in control. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. The Lord bless you. And should the Lord tarry tomorrow, we'll share thoughts again. But until then, Maranatha.